and welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged, the podcast that is committed to bringing you interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And today will be no aberration to that goal. We have an incredible podcast lined up. I'm going to get into that in just a moment, but I first want to broach the subject matter. And that is Theotokos, the one woman in the fullness of history selected by God to bring God and salvation into this world. I oftentimes think about the fact that the first Eve was deceived. She became a sinner. But the last Eve, she conceived and she brought forth a Savior. So what we're going to be talking about on the podcast today is the person who is the first to have achieved deification, and that in an incomparable and impeccable way. She, as has been well said, is the boundary of created and uncreated. She is the one who has crossed the frontier, which separates us from the ages to come. And as such, the last Eve who bore in her body the last Adam is forever exalted as more honorable than the cherubim and incomparably more glorious than even the seraphim. She's the greatest exemplar of union with God there is, was, or ever will be. And I say that as prologue to this podcast because for most of my Christian life, I personally lacked an appropriate appreciation for the grandeur and the glory of the mother of my Savior. And let me be frank in this regard. My sin involved not merely a dearth of enthusiasm, but let me also admit to consummate error. And that included the denial of the perpetual virginity of the mother of my Lord. I have both preached and written that Mary conceived children after the birth of Christ, And for that, I am truly sorry. The church has historically referred to Mary as our all-holy, immaculate, most blessed and glorious lady, the Theotokos and ever-Virgin Mary, and that not to provoke us to worship the creature in place of the Creator, but to affirm the ever-Virgin Mother of our Lord as well the new Holy of Holies, the new holy of holies in which the Shekinah glory of God dwelt in human form. You might say this is a way of describing the new Ark of the Covenant, a created being, a created being that somehow contained the uncontainable. And the reason that St. Joseph, the betrothed, this tradition calls him, didn't enter into marital relations with her is that he understood her as one would understand the ark, that she had been set aside for use by God, and that her womb had, in some sense, been made into a temple. Within Mary, and we'll be talking about that during the podcast today, within Mary is contained the history of God's economy. One of my favorite quotes, and I actually have this quote in my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, is a quote by St. Dimitri of Rostov, who said that one could ask why the Word of God delayed his descent to the earth and his incarnation to save fallen humanity, and then the answer he gave was this. It is because from the fall of Adam, it was not possible to find a virgin pure in body as well as in spirit. There was only one such, unique by her spiritual and bodily purity, who was worthy to become the church and the temple of the Holy Spirit. While the dogma of the Immaculate Conception is foreign to the Eastern tradition, the nature of the Mother of God was wondrously purified by the Holy Spirit, thus throwing open the way of deification to the whole of creation. One more quote. I wrote it down for this podcast. It's from St. Gregory 
Palamas, who described Mary as all beautiful. In her, he said, God brought together all the partial beauties which he distributed amongst other creatures and has made her the ornament of all beings, visible and invisible, or rather, he has made her a blending of all perfections, divine, angelic, and human, a sublime beauty adorning two worlds, lifted up from earth to heaven, and even transcending that. Let me add one more thing before we go to our guest. As I pointed out in my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, at times the honor that we give to the mother of our God quite naturally stretches into hyperbole. And I don't think that's surprising. If I describe my recently deceased earthly mother with a rhetorical flourish that exceeds the bounds of reality, how much more will I be prone to doing that very thing when searching for adequate ways to describe the first fruits of the glorified church. I'm talking, of course, about Theotokos. And my guest today wrote a book that captivated me in many ways. First of all, it is one of the most wondrously written books. I love the art of language. And my guest captures that art in her writing in this book. The book is titled A Long Walk with Mary, subtitled A Personal Search for the Mother of God, the author Brandy Willis Schreiber. And she is a poet. She's an author of poetry. She's a writer of nonfiction as well as award-winning fiction. And she is, like myself, a recent convert to orthodoxy. And again, the book is remarkable. It is a book that we make available to those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can get your copy for your support of our ministry. You can find it on the web at equip.org. Just go to the web at equip.org. You can get your copy, a great read. And I am delighted now to welcome Brandy to the podcast. Hi, Brandy. Hi, Hank. Thank you so much for that amazing prologue and introduction. I don't think I have anything else to add. (laughs) Well, I mean, I can tell you, you do, because I read your book. (laughs) And first of all, you are an extraordinarily gifted writer. And as someone that's written a few books myself, I appreciate someone that has the ability to not only write beautifully, but connect your own experience with that which is being communicated in Scripture. Mm, Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you're most welcome. We're talking, of course, about Theotokos, about Mary, the mother of God, the one whom Scripture describes as highly favored, blessed among women, The Third Ecumenical Council called Mary Theotokos, the bearer of God, as opposed to the heretical notion that she was merely Christotokos, bearer Mm -hmm. of Christ, a man in whom God dwelled as if in a temple. So without equivocation, you have the Third Ecumenical Council affirming the apostolic truth that Jesus is true God and true man, and that therefore the Virgin Mary is truly Theotokos, Mm -hmm. truly Theotokos the mother of God. Maybe, Brandy, you can talk a little bit about how significant it is for us to venerate someone that bore the infinite in her womb. Absolutely. Wow. You hit on exactly what I talk about in one of the big chapters in my book, which is the title of Mary and why we refer to her as Theotokos. And that is really centered on her role in our understanding of Christ. Everything about Mary in orthodoxy that we believe that we follow is Christological. That means that she represents and explains for us a Christ-centered reality, not a Mary-centered reality necessarily, but a Christ-centered reality. And so, for example, you you mentioned what does it mean for us to venerate her. When we look at icons of the Theotokos, 
you will see that they're set up in a very particular way. She is almost always holding Christ or in the presence of Christ. Very, very rarely is she ever depicted on her own because for us, those representations of icons, of those theological truths that are conveyed in these beautiful images that we're able to read and understand are Christological in their nature. And so to venerate her, not just in print, but, you know, through our interactions with icons, is to recognize her incredible importance in our faith and the role that she takes in salvation. And that without her, without her yes, Without her experience in the life of submitting to God's will, and as you said, so perfectly becoming the temple, her womb holding the uncontainable, you know, we would not have the salvation that we do. And I'm so glad that you mentioned what you did about St. Paul Amasa and what he wrote about her, that, you know, why is it that we've come to this place in time? You know, why did Mary come to us when she did? Well, it's exactly what you said. It's because there was no one up until her that fulfilled all of those needs of virtue, who was a virgin both, as you said, in spirit of essence, but also physically. And so it is an incredible thing to recognize that she has importance to us in our faith. And like you were saying in your introduction, you know, for so many of us for so long, we did not acknowledge that. And I think there's a great many people who misunderstand Mary, and I think they misunderstand her because they don't And they haven't been given the opportunity to really understand and learn about her role in the early Christian church, her position with us now, and why we turn to her the way that we do. There's a couple of things that you just said that deserve unpacking. The first thing you mentioned is the significance of icons of Mary. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you've written about this in your book. You talk about how in icons you see a manner in which Mary holds the Christ child. Mm -hmm. She holds her son lightly, and Mm -hmm. she turns her son toward the viewer. Maybe you can cash that out a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So let me just kind of set up this scene. I I know you have a wide variety of listeners, but for those of you who are familiar with an Orthodox Church, or maybe you're unfamiliar, whenever you, you come in and you see on the iconostasis, which is the big wall that separates the congregation from what's happening behind the altar. You'll see an icon of Christ on one side, on the right, and then you'll see an icon of Mary holding the Christ child on the left. And when we look at that particular icon of her, which is going to be the same wherever you go, she is holding him lightly. She has the Christ child in her embrace, But the reality of what that icon is teaching us, with the theological truth that it's trying to convey to us, is that she can't hold on to him forever. He's not necessarily for her for always. (laughs) She is giving him to us, to the room, to the viewer. She's positioning him in such a way that we see her tenderness, we see her gentle love for him in the way that the icon is written or painted. But we also see that she's not clutching him tightly. She's not holding him to her and saying, you know, with her embrace, I'm not going to let you go because I know the terrible things that are going to happen to you. She recognizes and has always recognized from the very beginning that she is going to have to let him go because he plays a great, great role in the entire history and salvation of mankind. And so you'll see her in those icons just kind of turning herself and turning him toward the viewer as if to say, this is the Christ child, this is your Savior, I would like to keep him, but I know that I can't. And that's teaching us a theological reality (laughs) about what we believe in terms of our salvation and what will ultimately happen to Christ on the cross when he is murdered. And so, yeah, there's so much that you see there, you know, in that particular icon. What you also see in that icon You see three stars on her, which is also something that you reference in terms of her perpetual virginity, and she always is conveyed with three stars, typically on her shoulders and then on the mantle that she's wearing, and that represents her virginity before, during, and after Christ's birth. And so, yes, that that idea that, you know, she can't She's not holding on to him for herself, but she's having to give him up to us is just an incredible way that this particular icon has been created and given to us 
as partakers in this experience, you know, to learn about and to understand, you know, what that multi-layered theological truth is. Yeah, and so we see in the icon that Mary is the turning point in the history of salvation. And I think it's beautiful the way in which, Brandy, you use your book to demonstrate that the icons of Mary always direct us to Jesus Christ. Yes, always. Yes, and she's always teaching us something about Him. And she serves as a human example to us, most definitely. But she is always, always, always pointing directly to him, either figuratively or or, uh, metaphorically through the way that she's portrayed. And so, and that's something that is a little bit different from what you might see in perhaps a Roman Catholic setting where there might be statues of her alone or images of her alone. In the Orthodox perspective, she's always pictured, almost always pictured with Christ in some sense. Now, there are a few icons of her that exist where she is by herself, but even in those icons, they're teaching us something about what it means to be by oneself. <laughs> and that, again, is pointing towards Christ is not with her in those particular moments for a reason. And so it doesn't matter, you know, what icon that you're looking at. She's teaching us something about salvation, about Christ's role in our salvation, about the presence of others in the relationship to Christ and his salvation. It's never typically going to just be a beautiful picture of her all by herself on a wall. There's always something else going on in those icons that direct us to these realities. I mentioned in your introduction, as I was introducing you to our audience, that you're a recent convert to orthodoxy. Maybe you can expand on your own feelings as you take this long walk with Mary, (laughs) the reverence that you suddenly garner for Mary as the mother of God, which is oftentimes a stumbling block to those who are not orthodox. Yes. So, you know, I talk about it a little bit in my introduction, but I am a fairly recent convert. My husband and I were both chrismated into the Orthodox Church in 2009, so a little bit over a decade. But, you know, it takes a long time (laughs) to learn how to be Orthodox, and it will take the rest of my life to learn how to be Orthodox. And I grew up in a Protestant Church of Christ background, and I'm very grateful for those early roots I had a very faithful family. I had a very wonderful experience in terms of the way that I viewed and the way that I was able to observe the reverence of my family in terms of being Church of Christ. But I always felt like there was something missing. And my greatest question was always, well, how do we know this? well, how do you know that that's what's really meant in the Bible when you quote that one scripture? Well, how do you know that this is really what this passage means? Well, how do we know that this is how we were supposed to do it? And I just felt for a very long time in my early adult years that I was missing something. And my husband and I actually both shared that same sentiment. And so after we were married, we realized that we need to find some kind of church. And so we started kind of shopping around, (laughs) as you typically do, and you're not really sure where you're supposed to go or where you belong. And in our quest to find a place, we found ourselves drawn more and more toward churches that had ritual and tradition and some of the deeper, more beautiful aesthetic elements. But we couldn't quite figure out, you know, well, what is the right one? We, you know, we, we went to a Lutheran church. We were pretty darn close, I think, to even trying out a Catholic church. And then one day my husband just said, why don't you visit this little Greek Orthodox church down the road? And at the time, he was in law school in Topeka, Kansas, and I was here in Lubbock, Texas. We were married, but he was finishing up law school, and I was here in Lubbock because I had gotten a job, and I was setting up our new home and kind of getting everything settled for us here in Lubbock while he finished up law school. And so I said, okay, I'll go and try it. And so I'm, you know, here I come, I show up at this Orthodox church with my Bible under my arm and (laughs) I walk in and oh my goodness, all of a sudden I'm like, what have I walked into? And I am just lamb (laughs) with color and sound and 
sights and smells and all the sensory experience that I had completely lacked in my Protestant upbringing. And I think I just probably looked like a deer in the headlights through that entire service. And it was long, you know, and I stood when everybody else stood. And I was very observant of everything that was going on and trying to follow along. And I very politely tucked my Bible down in the seat because it became quite obvious I wasn't going to be following along with that in this service. And um, at the end, my priest introduced himself to me and he said, well, it's nice to meet you. If we see you again, great. If we don't see you again, you know, have a great life pretty much. And I thought, wait a minute, you're not going to chase me out into the parking lot and, and try to get me to convert. And all through that service, let me tell you, I was looking at the icons. I was looking around the room and I was overwhelmed by what I was seeing, particularly with Mary. And so it took a very long time for me to actually acknowledge her. And I think the reason for that was because I didn't know how to, number one. Number two, it was quite intimidating. And then also, I wasn't really sure what it meant as a Protestant coming into an Eastern Orthodox setting to change my, quote unquote, you know, singular devotion to Jesus and God and to expand it to include the Mother of God and the saints and the angels, and all of these other cloud of witnesses that we have around us. And as I participated in services, particularly during the Akathis services on the Fridays of Great Lent, which is specifically for the Theotokos, I realized that I was getting very emotional, and I really needed to explore and unpack and figure out why that was. And the reality is, is that I just didn't know how to relate to her. I did not know what it meant to have a female guide in my life of that sense. I didn't know what it meant to pray to anyone other than Jesus. And I didn't recognize or appreciate the role that she had to play in my life and in the story of salvation. All I had known my entire life was that she was an important character in the Bible. She was the mother of God. And she looked really pretty on some Christmas cards. And my best friend is Catholic. And I had always appreciated the visual representations I saw of Mary around her house. And I was always curious of that, but I didn't know how to engage it. And so it took a long time. It took, it has taken 10 years for me to get to a place where I felt like I was brave enough to get to the root of some of those questions and errors and concerns and issues and really open myself up to not only learning about her historically, but reading what the church fathers had to say about her, what tradition has to say about her, what the church for 1,500 years believed about her before, you know, some of our more quote-unquote modern problems with her arose, and to figure out, you know, who is this person and why is she important and how do I need to incorporate her into my life? And so that is something that I feel like I'm still embarking on and still learning. And I think it's going to take the rest of my life to continue in this relationship and to see the fruits of these labors and where it's going to bring me. But I'm so incredibly grateful that I was able to spend this year searching for her, quote unquote, and taking this long walk with her and journaling, essentially, everything that I was reading and experiencing and praying about and turn it into a book that I hope will help other people who have a lot of those similar questions or backgrounds as I did. I appreciate the way that you describe this in your book as an illumination by degrees. <laughs> and in the book, you mention how obviously Mary was not God, mm -hmm. but you trace Mary's journey through life as one who patiently served and loved God, mm -hmm. one who followed the anthropos, God in human flesh, even to the foot of the cross. And even after. <laughs> and even after. This is what the, the beauty of the Orthodox tradition teaches us, is that once we close the books of the Bible, and we shut that and we set it on our nightstand, the people therein don't disappear. They had lives. They continued. We know what happens to a lot of people that are just mentioned in passing in the Bible because they were real living experiencers. I just made that word up. <laughs> but real living people who experienced the early church helped to shape it, helped to form it, helped to spread it. 
And they lived and died. And Mary was one of those people. And in Orthodox tradition, we are so lucky that we have information about her through various sources and that allows us to know truly how much she was loved, how much she was appreciated. You know, when we talk about loving the mother of God, we have to really think about what that means for a second. Christ was fully human, but he was also fully God. And he had a mother. He had a physical, real, born into the world, died in the world mother. Someone who provided him with not just flesh for his incarnation, but provided him with all of those day-to-day minutes and experiences of his growing up, his care, his love. You know, we tend to take for granted that so much of Christ's early life we don't know about, but we know that Mary, as his mother, cared for him. You know, she raised him up and helped him become the man that he was, the teacher that he was, the person that he was, and he loved her in return. And so, you know, if God is telling us that we are to love our neighbors, if this is one of the greatest commandments, right, that we are to love each other and love our neighbor as ourselves, that most certainly extends to the person who gave him physical life, right? But so often, especially if you're coming from a background that doesn't see the value of Mary, we just completely gloss over what that means. And that is such a disservice to our spiritual growth and to the fullness of what we can experience as Christians. Because then when you start thinking about the reality of this person and how important that she was, and then you start thinking about the reality of everybody else that he loved, and then it starts to just expand to the whole world in terms of this is what it means to love someone. It's so important. So you could probably write an entire book just on that idea of what does it mean to just love the mother of God. And when I say that, the more that we learn about her, the more we read in text and we read in things that the church fathers talked about and we understand what the early church really felt about her and how they interacted with her, we can see how important she really, really was. And then it becomes an impetus for us to want to model that. You know, we're never going to be perfect. And there is only one sinless one, which is Jesus Christ. But we can strive as best we can to try to emulate some of the virtues that Mary conveyed and possessed that made her worthy enough to be the vessel of our Lord and Savior. And so, gosh, I could just keep prattling on about that. But <laughs> Well, I hope you will, because what you're <laughs> communicating, I think, is very important. Much of what we know about the Virgin Mary comes not only from Scripture, but from holy tradition, the holy tradition of the Apostolic Fathers, which is not an independent instance. It's not a complementary source of faith. Ecclesiastical understanding couldn't add anything to Scripture, but it was the only means to ascertain and disclose the true meaning of Scripture. So tradition is the authentic interpretation of Scripture. And in that sense, it's coextensive with Scripture. It's Scripture rightly understood. And I think oftentimes the significance of holy tradition to which you allude is undervalued, underappreciated. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, especially in our modern Western world. You know, everything that we're talking about in terms of holy tradition, this is the way that the church lived and operated and continues to live and operate, things that haven't changed in the history. You know, and I I can speak freely about this because coming from my, you know, Protestant background, I felt like every church that was non-Orthodox that I visited was constantly trying to get back to what the early church was. Let's recreate this over and over again. Let's recreate church in our homes. Let's recreate church in the building. Let's recreate what it might have looked like to have the Last Supper with Jesus. But the reality is, is that the ancient church never went anywhere. And the tradition that has created what we have now is the entire platform on which we understand what is written in Scripture. And I think a lot of times people forget that the Bible didn't create church 
church created the Bible, and it started with the tradition that was almost immediately happening in the presence of Christ and and right after His resurrection and ascension. And in those hundreds of years before we had what we have now is the canon of the New Testament. And so, yes, tradition most definitely, I don't think, gets the fair shake that it deserves. And I think it's unfortunate that a lot of times it's viewed with suspicion, but it is 2,000 years of the how and the why of everything that we do. And without that tradition, you're constantly in a position of having to go back and trying to recreate what you see in the pages of scripture. And you don't have to, you know, (laughs) I mean, it's just, it is incredibly frustrating. I feel like for a lot of my friends that are searching for that and then don't realize that I have this tradition, I have this information, I have the way that things have always been done for many, many, many years. You know, since the fourth century, we're talking about the way even that the liturgy began to be shaped and how it was finalized in the 15th century. You know, we, we've got these wonderful things to fall back on that haven't had to change. And there is a lot of comfort and strength and I think rest in that, if I could use that word appropriately, because I don't have to use my rational brain to constantly try to figure out, well, how am I supposed to worship here? You know, tradition gives us all of those tools. All we have to do is live it. And that's where, you know, I think that's really where your faith can kind of take a turn for the better. You know, this is where you start to grow because you don't have to constantly try to figure it out. We have tradition to fall back on because it's telling you this is how this particular scripture is interpreted. This is why we do the liturgy the way that we do. This is why we have icons. This is why we have incense. This is what it means for us in terms of our worship and what we're offering back to God. And that's wonderfully freeing to me. Yeah, it is freeing. What you're saying in essence is that the Orthodox Church is not innovative. It is perpetuating the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And that in many regards, including asking for what you alluded to earlier, the prayers of the saints, or asking for the prayers of Mary. Can you expand on that? I sure can. So, you know, when we're asking for saints' prayers, it's like asking anyone for help. And it's not something that I want people to be confused about the difference between, you know, I'm praying to the saints or I'm praying to the dead because they're going to do this work for me. That's not true. The reality is is that the Bible is full of instances, full of instances where Paul tells us over and over, please pray for me, please pray for me. You know, and Jesus even tells us in Matthew 544 to pray for others, even if they don't ask for it. And so this idea of praying for each other is deeply, deeply rooted in our Christian faith. I would say that prayer for the way that we practice it is the foundation. It is the start of communion. It's this conversation that we're having. And so when we talk about praying to the saints, we're talking about praying to people who have gone before us. When someone dies, they're still members of the body of Christ. Their role doesn't change because they passed beyond our current limitations of time and space, right? Like, we pray for each other when we're alive. Why would we not continue to pray for each other, you know, for those that have passed on or ask them to pray for us? And even in Revelation 5, 8, I believe it is, John depicts the saints in heaven offering our prayers to God in the form of incense, of golden bowl of incense, of these things rising up. And so there's definitely scriptural references that indicate that they hear us, they are aware of us, and that praying to them is a good thing. You know, we pray for all of creation. Why would that not extend to the creation that perhaps we can't perceive because they've gone on before us, right? And it's like asking someone for help. You know, let's say that you are walking along a path and there's a river running beside you. And all of a sudden you hear someone in that river crying out, you know, help me, help me, please help me, please save me. Would you not stop and try to help that person? You know, of course we're going to do that. We're not going to leave that person there and say, well, sorry, you're not praying directly to God to have him come and help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to jump in there and help you. And so when we are praying to the saints, and in particular to the prayers of Mary, 
we are really praying for, you know, that relationship. We're praying for intercession. We're asking them to hear us, to intercede on our behalf, to pray for us as well, because God hears everything. He is the one that hears everything. He's present. He's going to be the one that's going to work the thing for, for its glory. And Mary served as one of the greatest intercessors for us. She was quite physically the closest thing to Jesus. <laughs> he loved her deeply. And as his mother, she occupies a very special role with him. And so, you know, as a strong intercessor, as someone that we can pray to, we can have assurance that she is also going to convey our needs and wants to Christ. And should it be God's will, that those questions and needs and, and prayers will be answered. And so I kind of crossed over a little bit, too, and in, in something else that I knew we were going to talk about, which is this prayer that we have of Theotokos, you know, Most Holy Theotokos, save us, that I think a lot of people have trouble with as well. You hear it a lot of times in the Orthodox Church. We say it over and over and over again. But the reality is, is that we're not asking her to specifically come and save us. The glory belongs to God. But it is Mary who is hearing us and is going to intercede for us on our behalf. And it doesn't mean that she's a co-redemptress. You know, only Christ saves. Only Christ is the one that presents the final judgment and, you know, grants us life eternal. But we certainly have help, in other words, from those who have gone before. And we should certainly continue to pray for them as well. I think as you're pointing out, Brandy, we're not worshiping Mary. We're venerating Mary. And that is something that we rightfully do because she's the most exalted among God's creatures. I mean, not Mm -hmm. one of the most, but she's the most exalted among those who have been created by God. In fact, there's a quote by Dr. David McConey. I was looking at it earlier today as I was preparing for the podcast. He beautifully fleshes out Augustine's contention that we Mm -hmm. were not created to be merely human, but in time to become more than human, ultra hominis, as the divine image and likeness in humans is ultimately fulfilled through deification. Mm -hmm. For God not only wishes to vivify us, he said, but to deify us. And I bring this up because Mary is the quintessence of what it means to be deified. So we look at her as an exemplar. In orthodoxy, we say God became man so that man might become God. And we're not talking about identity of essence. We become not what God is by nature, but we become gods by grace, gods by participation in the divine nature. And so Mary is this role model for what we want to be, what we want to strive after. She is the personification of what it means to experience union with God, fellowship in the Holy Trinity. So she becomes our icon in that sense. Absolutely. Yes. She is the penultimate example (laughs) of what we could hope to be and what we strive to be. And when, you know, this idea that she was just merely human, you know, when you start to think about these things in context of the greater reality of our salvation, it really starts to lessen a lot of those old arguments, doesn't it, (laughs) that seem to minimize her. I mean, suddenly my husband and I talk about this a lot, you know, the big what if questions, you know, if it was true that God just needed a womb and he just needed, you know, a young person to be able to carry him to full term, to be able to birth him, to be young enough to raise him up, you know, he would have just chosen anyone, right? Absolutely not. He had to choose the absolutely best and most perfect vessel that he could to embody the best and most perfect example that he is. And it's Mary. Mary is the one that he chose. Her virtues, her dedication, her spiritual life. The early church fathers wrote extensively about a lot of her virtues and what made her so important and so beloved to God. And the fact that, you know, this is the person that God himself chose to occupy, exalts her above anyone else, exactly as you said. 
And it just becomes, you know, the more that you contemplate on these things, the more your mind kind of blows and you realize, oh, goodness, I think I need to give this some second thought about, you know, my previous persuasions about Mary or the things that I might have minimized about her in my previous faith. And it's something that you hope anybody who has the least bit of curiosity might be willing to dive into to learn more about her and to really see what her role in our salvation is, because it's incredible. Her simple yes makes our existence today what it is. I mean, that's just the reality. I love what you say in your book about that, that without Mary's physicality and human nature, we would be without the incarnation of Christ. And that is a role that cannot be overstated. Yes, exactly. Without her, there would be no Jesus. (laughs) It goes hand in hand. And everything that we believe, I would argue, about Christ, we have to believe about Mary as well. And I think this is something that makes some people very uncomfortable, because they want to just look at Christ as He is the whole, but we cannot forget all of the other people and all of the other realities that make up the entirety of our story and the entirety of our faith. And I think to cut Mary out without giving her any credit, to just say, well, no, she was just a minor player. She's just a minor character in the Bible. It's neither here nor there. It was just a woman that, you know, bore Christ, (laughs) bore God (laughs) incarnate, um, is to do a great disservice to Christ himself, but also to the entirety of the Christian faith. And I think if you really start to think about that and unpack that, you can't get away from the importance that she plays in our lives. You can't escape that, because if you start to downplay one aspect of Mary, in my opinion, you start to downplay the entirety of our Christian faith, because God doesn't lie, and He's not changeable. He's not transitory the way that our human nature is. He is the reality, and He is going to choose and utilize only the best that he possibly could to be his mother. And that serves as an incredible example to us as Christians. You're right about the difference that one yes to God can make and how that is personified in the life of obedience and humility of Theotokos. And in relation to Mary's yes, you make the note that This is a very significant argument for libertarian freedom, for freedom of the will, that God is not a puppet master, that our choices truly matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when I talk about Mary's yes in the book, this is not a new idea, (laughs) but it's just presented in perhaps a slightly different way. She had her own free will. Mary was not someone that God decided from the very beginning was going to be the one to carry him, and it better be this way or the highway. No, she always had free will. She always had the ability to say no if she wanted to. She always had the free will there. God was not going to force anything upon her, but she chose to trust in that moment. She chose through the confusing message that the angel had brought to her about the reality of what was about to happen to her, not to argue with the biology of it or even the reasoning of it, but to simply say, yes, if it is God's will that this be so, let me be the one to help fulfill it. And I think we have to look at that in our own lives and say, hmm, am I saying yes? to God's will in the same way that she did, you know, imagine this very young, very probably quite shaken, I would say, woman who is is being approached by an angel and basically telling her, although you're not married and although you're not going to have any kind of sexual relations, you're actually going to be carrying the Messiah. (laughs) You are the one that's going to be the mother of the Messiah that is coming, and this is what's going to happen. I mean, can you imagine in that place and that time, how much fear that would send through a typical person, right? But Mary says, you know, if it's thy will, let it be done. She is completely 
subservient to God, not because she's being manipulated by him, but because she has complete and total and utter faith and trust in him. And how often do we do that? How often in our lives do we have complete and utter and total faith and trust in God? I would venture to say not very often, truly, not very often. We object a lot. (laughs) We stop and say, yeah, but what if this, you know, dot, dot, dot. No, for Mary, there was no hesitation. And that simple yes changed the entire story of salvation, as you said. She was the turning point in this the reality of Christ incarnate became true. You know, we start to enter into this reality, and without her, we wouldn't have it. You know, you mentioned so many interesting things in this conversation as well as in your book. One of them you just alluded to is the angel, not only an angel, but an archangel. Mary doesn't seem troubled at the appearance of this majestic Archangel, and I think as listeners to this podcast, you can imagine an archangel appearing in the room at this very moment, appearing before you. What would you do? And yet Mary isn't troubled. She even has the temerity, the reckless boldness to converse with an archangel. (laughs) So the point that you make in the book, if I catch you correctly, and I think I do, is that there's an inference here that angels were not foreign to Theotokos, the mother of God. Yeah, so there is a lovely church tradition and teaching on this, that when Mary was dedicated and served in the temple, that she was so holy and so virtuous that she conveyed with angels and they even brought her food. And, you know, I just love the idea of that thoughtful, mystical aspect of traditional teaching, because you're right. You know, when we read this account in Luke, I think there is an element for sure of surprise, but also an element of familiarity, because if we are to follow the example that Mary presents for us as someone who is so holy and so virtuous, that many people refer to her as the first person who really practiced consistent and ongoing prayer. St. Gregory Palamas writes that she was the first example of hesychism, you know, of this practice of silence and being in the presence of God and praying continuously. If we are to achieve the kind of spiritual example that she had, perhaps we would be as close to angels and perhaps we would feel the presence of God and what's beyond more than we really do. But we don't, right? Because we fall very far from that example through our struggle. But yes, in the Annunciation, that element is definitely there of where she has the ability to, you know, be in the presence of the archangel and to converse with him. But, you know, also at the same time, have her wits about her enough to say, okay, (laughs) yes, I will do this. (laughs) I will fulfill whatever this will is for me from God. I love the way that you humanize so many of the characters that you talk about. And I'm thinking specifically right now of St. Luke. You say that no other gospel author references Mary's inner perspective the way St. Luke does. And there's one part in your book where you talk about, in an imaginary sense, what it might have been like. And this could have happened. Luke Mm -hmm. visiting Mary in a lamp-lit room and asking Mary to recount what happened the night the Savior was born. Yeah, I think of all of the Gospels, you know, Luke was really interested, the way that he writes, he was really interested in the person and the person's story. And we see a lot of these hints of emotionality from him and his account that we don't really get in the other Gospels. He was a wonderful journalist, if you will, a wonderful converser. You know, he was the doctor. I think he had a greater sense of kind of the human aspect and human struggles of the people and the stories associated with the early church. And so whenever I read him, I just, I just really like the way that he portrays I guess the everydayness 
of what these people experienced. And with Mary in particular, who obviously was much beloved by him as well, because, you know, Mary was known to all of the apostles and all of the disciples, and people were aware of her, right? And they spent a lot of time with her because she was with Christ on his teaching circuits, and she was with him, as we know, until the very end. But he uses this phrase a lot whenever he's writing about her account, that she pondered these things, and she kept them in her heart. And that's such a lovely, emotional, personal detail that he includes. And I think it's so wonderful that we have that in Scripture we have that reference to what she was thinking and feeling because, you know, when the angels appeared to her at the nativity of Christ, all of these wonderful and amazing things that happened and the shepherds came and said what they had witnessed and she quietly ponders these things in her heart. Whenever Luke, I think, was quote-unquote interviewing her or talking with her about her experience, you know, how would you take these incredible encounters and this incredible reality of your life. And you wouldn't know how to put words to it, right? She was the kind of person that was, I think, and I'm completely conjecturing here, but based on everything that I've read, I think she was the kind of person that was deeply introspective and pondered and thought about and wondered at all of these wonderful things that had happened to her, these incredible things, because she was the primary witness to them. And I I just love that detail that Luke includes. It's my favorite gospel to read because it is so humanizing, the way that he writes about people. And I think it's important that that's the detail that's included. You know, it's very subtle. If you weren't really reading closely or you didn't really think that that was important, you might gloss over it. But Why would he include such a personal element about Mary's story in Scripture? Well, obviously, because it was important. It shows us that he continued to talk to her. It shows us that he talked to her at some point about her experience carrying Christ, giving birth to Christ, the miracles that she witnessed, because he had to go back and get that account from her. And I think that that's a really important detail that's included in scripture that we need to link us to who Mary is. And I think that also reinforces her legitimacy, her importance to us and to the early believers as well. You know, one of the things you do so beautifully in your book is you, you bring up subjects that we might otherwise gloss over. And one of those subjects I think is a quintessential point, and that is that Mary is associated with the miraculous. And you, in your book, associate the first miracle as a way of talking about this, the miracle of changing water into wine. Yes. So I love (laughs) this passage so much. And this is really what kind of kicked off for me. I think this was the moment whenever I was researching and writing and reading about Mary, that it really became a turning point for me about how important she was. And what I'm talking about is the miracle at Cana. It's <laughs> in the Bible, the first miracle that Christ performs at the wedding at Cana. And if you have time to go back and read it, I would encourage anybody listening to really, really, really give that a close reading, because what's in the scripture is important, but I think there's also some things that are in between the lines that are important as well. And one of those things is that this was a poor country wedding, you know, possibly a wedding of a distant family member, which some tradition teaches that maybe it might've been someone related to Mary. This is why she was so concerned about why the wine had run out at the wedding. And we know that, you know, if we're celebrating something really important and there's no more booze, (laughs) the celebration might end a little early. And the wine was such an important part of this marriage celebration. And so she comes to Christ and she says to him, the wine has run out and doesn't say anything else, doesn't ask him to do anything, doesn't say, sweetie, can you perform a miracle for us? Or, hey, you know what? I've seen you do some pretty incredible stuff as a child. Do you mind like helping out here? No, she simply states, the wine has run out. The wine is gone. And he turns to her and he says, you know, basically, woman, what does that matter to me? My time hasn't yet come. And he doesn't use the term woman to be denigrating. It's actually a term of great reverence in the ancient world. So he's actually referring to her with great reverence when he calls her woman. And he's saying to her, 
why does this matter right now? Because my time hasn't yet arrived. I'm not yet ready to reveal my full glory and to be, you know, basically begin the kingdom on earth. And Mary, you know, they have this moment of quiet between them. And what happens is, is that she turns, you know, to the servants that are there and she says to the servants without saying words, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Mary is the very first witness. Mary is the very first believer because she believed in the reality and she knew who Christ was before anybody else did. You know, the disciples were clueless. They were always getting it wrong. You know, they were constantly asking, well, who is this person? And what do you mean here? They're misinterpreting Jesus' teachings all the time. He had to constantly explain himself to them. And even at the very end, they still didn't get it, right? But his mother knew from the very beginning because she had witnessed the miraculous from the very beginning. It was a miracle in and of itself in a way that she was conceiving Christ and she got to be the witness to his very first miracle when he turned the washing water into the best wine that could have possibly been served at that poor country wedding. And that was what began Christ's ministry on earth. And it was because of this interaction and this exchange between him and his mother. And so it makes perfect sense that from there, you know, Mary becomes associated with the miraculous after Christ's death and resurrection. You know, not immediately, but in particular throughout her life and through her death and then for the faithful that have gathered around her and drawn strength from who she is and have prayed to her and whose faithfulness through her has expanded their faithfulness and their belief in God and the church, she becomes associated with a lot of miracles. And I, my personal opinion, <laughs> when you really read closely, it's because she was the first one from which these miracles began. And I, I just, I, it's my favorite passage in the Bible. I absolutely love that. I think, you know, Christ, as John writes, Christ did so many miracles and so many wonders. You know, the whole earth couldn't contain all the books if we wrote them all about what he did. But there are these lovely examples and these lovely remnants that we have of Mary's interaction with him. And so that's what I think about that. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I think it's so beautifully stated too, Brandy, because just this morning I was reading Matthew chapter 11. And in Matthew chapter 11, you have John the Baptist in prison, and he's sending his disciples to Jesus. And he has a question for Jesus via the disciples that he's sending. And that question is, are you the one that we're waiting for, or should we expect another? And you could almost imagine St. John in prison. He's incarcerated. He's languishing in prison. And here Jesus, instead of overthrowing the wicked Herods of the world, instead of liberating the Jews, he's allowing John to remain in prison. And this might have been very disconcerting for John the Baptist. And so the question, and what's the answer of Jesus? Well, tell John that the deaf are now hearing, the blind are now seeing, the lepers are cleansed. In essence, what Jesus does, he even talks about the dead being raised. He points John back to the Old Testament prophecies in which Messiah would come and do those very things, and therefore we could know beyond the peradventure of a doubt that this is indeed Messiah, that this is the only one who could walk through the doorway of the Old Testament prophets as the one who was to come. And the one who is to come isn't one who overthrows through violence, but rather shows the miraculous. I mean, judgment will inevitably come, but Jesus demonstrates who he is through the miracles. And as you say, Mary is not in the least unfamiliar with the power of Jesus. She knows that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. She 
is the quintessence again of the one who understands that this is Messiah. Mm-hmm. She in knew the midst before of the anybody disciples. else. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, she knew before anybody else, and she stayed with him until the very end. Yeah, absolutely. What a poignant scene that is at the foot of the cross. And this is something that we ought to point out as well. I mean, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, to whose care does he commend Mary? Well, to John, to Mm -hmm. John the Beloved. If Jesus had other biological brothers and sisters, he would have commended his mother to their care. Exactly. And this ties in exactly to why we are so stuck on (laughs) the wrong term, but we believe that Mary was perpetually a virgin, that she and Joseph did not engage in a marital relationship that resulted in biological children, that she was, before, during, after his birth, for the rest of her life, a virgin. And you're exactly right. That's another subtle reading that a lot of people gloss over or they don't understand in English translations that the brothers and sisters of Christ tradition teaches were actually children of Joseph from a prior marriage and that he was a widower and that had there been someone, a biological son to marry other than Jesus, that that person would have been responsible for caring for her. But when you, again, when you read between the lines of Scripture and you see what happens, Joseph disappears <laughs> from our story in the Bible because he's no longer alive. And, you know, there's no one to care for Mary. She's followed in Christ's footsteps. She's been with him every step of the way. And at the foot of the cross, as he's dying this horrible, unimaginable death, and all the others have run away. Everyone else is in hiding because they're afraid. Mary and some of the women and St. John are there witnessing his final breath. And he turns to St. John, the beloved, and says, this is now your mother. (laughs) This is the person that I want you to care for. And she goes and she's taken under care by John and, and she lives with him and he cares for her for the rest of her life as if, you know, he was her own son. And so that's a very, very important detail that I think a lot of people miss or perhaps misunderstand when they're reading these passages. Brandy, you mentioned Joseph the betrothed. Talk about the significance of betrothal and the difference between that and modern engagement. Sure. So ancient betrothal was as good as marriage. We have to think about what the ancient world was really doing whenever a couple got betrothed or engaged. Really, it was a definite and binding contract of sorts, a promise that I'm going to marry this person. This is the person with whom I'm going to live and, you know, consummate the marriage and possibly have children. It was usually contracted and negotiated between families, and it didn't look anything like what our modern courtship or our modern engagement is. You know, nowadays, how do people get married? Well, typically the story goes, we meet someone, we're attracted to them, we fall in love, we have, you know, common interests, etc. We decide we want to have a life together. And those two people come to an agreement that they want to get married. And then, you know, you can break off an engagement if you want to. If you decide you don't want to marry this person or he doesn't want to marry you, there's, you know, typically no harm, no foul, <laughs> because two independent people are deciding together whether or not they want to get married. And, of course, there's still cultures today that do arranged marriages, but I'm talking about this idea of just modern engagement. Whereas in the ancient world, if you were betrothed to someone, you were promised to that person And to break off a betrothal was pretty much the equivalent of having to get a divorce. And so we talk about, you know, we refer to to Joseph the betrothed because when we look at that relationship with Mary and Joseph from the teaching of the church and an Orthodox tradition, you know, it was really more of a guardianship because you have to understand a little bit of the background of what tradition teaches us about what happened to Mary. So after she was dedicated and served in the temple, when she reached the age of womanhood, or in other words, was menstruating or was capable of producing children, 
the high priest decided, obviously, that she can't stay here. But because of who she was and her role in the temple, someone who was so greatly devoted to God, she had enacted a vow of chastity to devote herself wholly and entirely to God, which meant not marrying and remaining a virgin. And that was the way to free up any kinds of distractions or things that could pull us away from a complete devotion and wholehearted attention on God, just like, you know, many monks or nuns today would remain celibate. It's a way to cut out the things that could cause us to not focus on God and to be wholly devoted. And so where is she going to go? You know, the high priests know that she's taken this vow of chastity. She's not going to get married because to force her into a typical marriage would mean defiling her but also defiling the vow that she has taken to God. And no one wants to do that. And so tradition teaches that basically lots were cast. And Joseph, the widower, was the one who came up as the lucky guy (laughs) who got to basically be betrothed to Mary to be a guardian and a protector of her for the rest of his living life, and ideally for hers as well, for as long as it may last. And so, again, this is where we come back to the church's absolute stance that she always remained a virgin, that she did not enter into a typical marriage relationship with Joseph, and she did not have biological children with him, that Christ was obviously her only, only child. And so, you know, when we look at ancient betrothal, we see how important it was to enter into a contract like this with a quite heavy thing for her to do, but a very heavy thing for Joseph to do as well. You know, tradition teaches that he was old, you know, probably maybe around 80 years old, and had had a fairly rich previous married life and had several children of his own. And so imagine, you know, kind of the consequence that he experiences being the one to have to answer this call, if you will, and to follow God's will, and to take this young woman home (laughs) to... (laughs) to his home and to live out this, you know, married looking life when she's so young and he's so old. And the reality is, is that, you know, one of the fathers writes that, you know, there was a a lot of hesitancy on his part because she was younger than some of his grandsons. So in the book, I talk about one of the icons that you can, well, you can't view it anymore because I think now it's become a mosque, but one of the churches in Istanbul actually has a very, very early icon of Mary and Joseph traveling to his home. And it's interesting because he is portrayed as kind of scurrying in front of her and looking back at her with this sort of uncertain expression on his face. And you can tell that they're hurrying through town, getting away from the the eyesight of, you know, the townspeople because their robes and their clothes are kind of fluttering around their feet, which is indicating a lot of very quick movement. And a lot of the Orthodox complete icons of the nativity, you'll also often see Joseph down in the corner of the icon by himself, sometimes being tormented by the devil. You know, he's whispering, we imagine, words of doubt into his ear about this virgin birth that has just taken place above him in the icon. Mary's depicted often above him in a cave with the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And so um, (laughs) I kind of ventured off a little bit maybe further than you wanted me to go in terms of the tradition and teaching on Joseph, but it is a very important point, you know, again, to kind of humanize those experiences, the early church was very aware of some of these things. And we lose a lot of that in just modern interpretations and readings, you know, without this ancient tradition, without these ancient icons and these stories to kind of fill in the gaps for us, we kind of miss a lot of the true responsibility that that was for both of them. You know, Mary had to trust him explicitly, which means she had to trust God implicitly. And Joseph also had to trust that this was the right thing to do, because what a difficult thing that must have been for a man of his age to take this young bride home. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I couldn't help but think as you were speaking, Brandy, about the significance of this thing we're calling holy tradition. This is not minimalistic. I mean, we're talking about very significant figures in church history, 
St. Ambrose or John of Damascus or Gregory Palamas, who we've mentioned a number of times in this conversation. So the holy tradition that we're talking about is accentuated, underscored. It is highlighted by some of the greats in church history, and that gives it gravitas, doesn't it? Absolutely. And we also need to mention, too, that this is these are writings that happened several hundred years <laughs> into the history of the Church. So not just immediately after Christ's resurrection and ascension, but we're talking about as the Church grew out of a religion that had to hide in homes and was greatly persecuted into a religion that was, you know, lauded and became a religion of the state, if you will. It was made legal. In fact, with Constantine becoming the religion of the state, the primary religion, you know, these things were thought about, written about, thought over, much ink and blood was spilled over them. They're not to be taken lightly. And as you mentioned in the very beginning of our conversation, the ecumenical councils that set these things definitively into what they are and why we believe them, you know, as doctrines and dogmas of the church, that is something that, you know, we can't separate the tradition and the reality of that out of our modern day faith. And I think that that happens a lot with people, or they just don't know the history of it. They don't know what really went into what we believe today and why it's so important and why it's so important not to reject it. Yeah, I think the thing you just mentioned about history, having this experience that you had as a convert to orthodoxy, you can attest to the fact that most of us growing up have no sense of early church history. Mm -hmm. We don't really know that much about what happened right after the ascension of Jesus Christ. We don't know about the apostolic fathers. We don't know mm -hmm. about the church fathers, the pre- and post-Nicene fathers, or the great church apologists. And that's a missing mm -hmm. part of history that is so important. This is when the church was young. And we do have, as you alluded to earlier, we do have a sense of how church was done early on. We do have a sense, just as you also alluded to or directly pointed out, that it is the church that is the ground and pillar of truth, that it is the church that gave us Holy Scripture. And I want to segue from that point to your love for the Bible, your love, as you mentioned, for St. Luke's Gospel. And one of the poignant aspects of this Gospel is that St. Luke chronicles the prophecy of Simeon, the prophecy that a sword would pierce Mary's own soul. Yes. So she, and you draw this out so beautifully in the book, she is an intercessor for us who is sensitive to the sufferings of the entire world because she has experienced the suffering and death of her own son. Yes, yes, absolutely. If we think about, you know, who is the one person that really understands sorrow and loss and needless, well, put that in quotes, needless death, right, of the most horrible and ultimate experience, it would be the mother of God. Because not only did she bear him in her body, but she saw him grow. She loved him his entire life. And I, I'm, I'm speaking from an emotional perspective here because I'm a brand new mother myself. And so this is all very fresh and new for me as I, you know, <laughs> I'm understanding now a lot more of what Mary experienced having become a mother myself, but she bore him. She had this entire life with him. She watched him perform these miracles. She listened and observed while the scribes and the Pharisees and the high priests over and over and over again, denied Christ and called him a liar, and challenged him, and, you know, plotted to bring him down. She saw firsthand the betrayal of one of his closest, you know, for 30 pieces of silvers, silver. She watched him being nailed to a cross and to experience his murder 
in front of everyone else while the people that claimed to love him fled. And then she watched as his body was taken down, his lifeless body, as it was dressed, as it was laid in a tomb. I mean, talk about, I just can't even imagine that as a parent experiencing the incredible, you know, the vastness of all of that and and then losing a child, you know, and not just a child, but knowing that these people that Christ loved, he died for them. They killed God in essence, right? She knows that he's not just a man. He's not just a boy, that that he is God incarnate. And you think, how can they do that? How can they not understand? How could they have witnessed as we've talked about all of these miracles and seen all these things that he's done, healed people, raised the dead, fed the hungry, you know, absolved people, given them hope, given them faith, told them to live a new life, you know, all the things that he's, he's delivered to them, how can they not see? And they still murder him. And she still watches that right from the foot of the cross. I mean, it's just, you know, you just can't wrap your brain around it. And so it makes the prophecy of Simeon that much more poignant because you realize the sword that pierces through her own soul is the fact that she has to watch God die. <laughs> she has to watch her son die on the cross. And then you, you come to realize this is what it meant. This is what that meant. And you go back in time with her to that moment and you think, if only you knew what was coming and, and she didn't know, you know, you don't really know. We don't think you, you can't really conceive of it until you're in that moment experiencing it. It's a heartbreaking moment. But then this is where we can turn to her because we understand that she understands more than anybody else what it means to experience a loss like that. And we know because she's real and we know because she was Christ's mother and she exists that she can sympathize with us and empathize with us. And whatever betrayals or sorrows or losses or hate or disappointments that we experience, to some degree, she can empathize with that. And so she has become for us you know, the mother of all, the mother of all sorrows, but the one who is the great intercessor who who listens to us as only the best mother possibly could and can take it to her son because of the position that she's in. It's so incredible when you talk about how Christ fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. He walked through that doorway. And the Old Testament prophets not only talk about the fact that Jesus would perform miracles, including raising the dead, but they also talk about the fact that he would heal the earth. So they Mm -hmm. allude to the ultimate reality where Jesus takes a bride and carries that bride over the threshold of Jordan into a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for her husband. The beauty of Christ's fulfillment of those prophecies and the poignancy of that happening in time and space and people being willing Mm -hmm. to deny Messiah in their midst Mm -hmm. can't be lost on us. And you talk about that so beautifully in the book. I love the way that you weave your own story into the story of Scripture, the reality as a mother having a baby kicking in your womb, I can't relate to that. But I, you know, as a father of 12 children, I can certainly relate to that vicariously through my wife. But the very earthiness of that, you've experienced a baby kicking in your womb, and then you extend that to the fact that this most surely is something that Mary herself experienced. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. The physicality of everything that we experience, you know, she experienced too. And so, you know, I think that's why when we really think about her being a person and being real, right? I keep coming back to this argument that I make that she was just more than a character in the Bible because that was the attitude that I grew up with, right? But when we start to really think about the reality and the humanness of the people who lived out this story and are part of our story of salvation, we realize that they're much closer to us than we could ever realize, we could ever imagine. And this is what makes praying to the saints and 
communing really with those that have gone before us so much more important than we could, you know, than we know to give credit to because they're so close to us. You know, they're not distant. They're not separate from our experience. They're not separate from the lives that we lead now. I mean, they're right there. The veil is thin. (laughs) We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, as Hebrews says. We're surrounded by that. And these witnesses don't have you know, tape over their eyes and their ears and their mouth, they're participating in life with us. You know, when we begin to pray and we contemplate on these things, I'm going to use the term activation. I know that's not a very scriptural term, but something is activated within and without us that draws us closer into communion. And, you know, and a primary teaching of the Orthodox Church is that we are saved in communion. We're not saved individually. The hope and the purpose is that every single person will come to know the glory of Christ, that every single person will be saved. This is the hope that we have. We are not separate from other people around us. We're all one body and one member in Christ. And so when I wrote the book, I really was trying to approach all of these difficult, (laughs) very difficult, very hard to explain, very heavy concepts, with the truth of that, I am an ordinary person, an ordinary Orthodox Christian trying to live this stuff out in my life, struggling with it daily, usually failing with it, sometimes doing okay, but most of the time failing with it, and trying to convey through my writing what it might be like to walk that journey with someone else who's attempting to have a relationship with the Theotokos, because I'm, you know, I am not an academic in any of these areas. I haven't been, you know, to seminary or anything. I'm just an ordinary person learning and using the resources available to me that are available to everybody else to work on my faith and to work on these very difficult concepts with the guidance of my priest and with the guidance of the Orthodox Church and under the tutelage of tradition and in a life in which I'm trying to live out my faith as best that I can. And so I'm glad to hear you say that you felt like I succeeded in weaving (laughs) real life experiences in with what it means to search these things out, because I just couldn't find a lot of modern writing or a lot of modern memoirs that explored these topics. And so I thought I would do it myself. (laughs) Yeah. You could talk about that a little more as an author. I'm just fascinated by your writing style, captivated. I don't remember who first gave me this book, whether it was my wife, Kathy, or one of my children, I think it was my son, David. But when I first got this book, I thought, you know, I know a substantial amount about this subject. I've immersed myself in this subject. And I thought, I don't know if I'm interested in reading this book. And then I started reading. (laughs) And quite frankly, I couldn't put the book down. I was mesmerized by your writing because you take the circumstances of your own life and they're woven into the tapestry of what you're explaining. And so I think the title, A Long Walk with Mary, is just very appropriate to what you have done. Can you talk a little bit about writing? What an art that is and how incredibly accomplished you are. I'm saying that. You're not saying that about yourself, but I'm saying that. I mean, I I love good writing and you are a masterful writer. I felt in many ways that I was reading a novel. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't know what to say to all of that. Just lovely compliments. Thank you so much. I am more than happy to talk about writing. (laughs) Do you want to know more about kind of my approach or? I want to know whatever you have to say. Oh, gosh. Bottom line. Well, (laughs) bottom line. Well, I think, I think that it is the gift that God has given me and Ever since I was a very young child, one of my earliest memories was picking up a book and knowing to read it. And so I think this memory that I have, I obviously knew how to read at that time. It probably was just a very small, you know, children's board book or something for toddlers. But I I knew how to read at that point because I remember reading the book and I remember closing the book and looking at the front and seeing the title and seeing the author name and just thinking to myself, that must be the best job in the world. 
because a book had taken me somewhere else. And so I've always loved reading and writing and words and being an introvert. It is much easier, in case you can't tell, for me to write about a thing than it is to talk about a thing. (laughs) I prefer greatly to spend time contemplating things and putting them down on paper before they come out of my mouth. But I've always enjoyed writing. And when I was in college, I decided to quit nursing school with just a year left (laughs) because I didn't want to do that as my career. I really wanted to do something that was going to make me happy. And I changed my major to English and I never looked back. And it, it was so wonderful because it gave me a chance to really immerse myself in literature and just you know, nerd out. I love reading. I love talking about books. I love talking about themes and what did you pick up in this? And, you know, it just, like you said, it just becomes the tapestry of my soul, I think. And so this is a gift that God has bestowed on me. And I've tried pursuing a lot of different things, but my main focus in grad school was in poetry. And I'm very grateful for that because I'm a terrible poet. (laughs) I'm going to be the first person to admit I really struggle with poetry, but I love the way words come together and the images and the mystery that they can evoke. And I'm grateful for that foundation in poetry because I felt like it developed in me an appreciation for language and particularly the way that language sounds. So when I was first exploring the idea of this book, it really came out of journal entries. I spent about a year journaling all my thoughts and confusions and hurts with life and frustrations and then, you know, asking God to come in and basically make himself known to me. You know, help me, show me who Mary is. Mary, you show yourself to me. What am I supposed to learn out of this? What am I supposed to do? And so as I read things in various texts, I would write about what I was reading in real time with what I was experiencing. And so when you read the book, it basically is a memoir of a year of my life. And it was a year that was fraught (laughs) with a lot of challenges, both personal and spiritual. But it is a really, I think, a really honest interpretation and example of what a year in a typical Christian's life might be like. You know, stuff happens with your family You are struggling to get over some hurts and disappointments. You're experiencing terrible moments of fear and loss. And where is God in all of this? And how does prayer help me? You know, and on top of all these things I'm experiencing, what am I reading in all of these church fathers and all of these texts? And what do they mean? And how are they relevant to my understanding of Mary? And I think I just tried to weave it all together to just represent a regular life. (laughs) And so... I don't think I want every year of my life to read (laughs) the way that that particular year did because I'd be pretty stressed out and tired. (laughs) But my next project that I'm really wanting to invest in once I have the time, because I'm a stay-at-home mom right now to my 11-month-old son, is I would like to write a devotional of his first year of life and all of the spiritual lessons I've learned along with watching him grow in this first year of his life and all of the challenges I've experienced in this first year of life. And it kind of may be like a a sequel (laughs) to this long walk with Mary, but expanding it into some greater spiritual experiences and truths that I'm researching and trying to learn more about. Well, if you write it, I'll read it. I want you to do one more thing for our audience, and that is talk about reading. I'm doing a new little feature here at the Christian Research Institute called Hank Unplugged Shorts. And basically what that is is just a little thought that I have for the day. And the thought that I had for today had to do with reading, how we need to get hooked on reading all over again, how reading must become an ever more disciplined life practice for all of us. And we could cite statistics, but the bottom line is the numbers of people not reading today, not reading the Bible, not reading books in general, is staggering. A full Mm -hmm. quarter of the population did not so much as read a single book in the past year. And I'm talking about how significant it is to read that you're communing with an absent author that, you know, the author could be dead, but very much alive when they were writing. And it opens a whole world to us. And I think so many people have lost that beautiful world. You know, you read Mere Christianity, and here you have one of the great authors in history 
very much alive when he was writing, and you get to engage that mind. Or if you read the Bible, you get to engage the mind of St. Luke, as you point out so beautifully in your book. Maybe you can whet the appetite of people as we close this podcast with the beauty of reading, reading God's Word Mm -hmm. and reading other books. Absolutely. I mean, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of just taking five or ten minutes of your day. It doesn't have to be an hour-long reading session. In fact, I long for the day (laughs) when I could read at my leisure. You know, I love being a mom, but it is sun up to sundown, and I, you know, I collapse into bed at the end of the night, and I used to read for hours, and I I wish I could read again like I once did. It, It will come again, but right now there's more important things. But yes, if you just pick, just pick five or ten minutes, and I think setting up your day is so very, very important. You know, if I could, you know, encourage a structure, it would be to get up and first of all, give thanks and say some kind of, of morning prayer. If it's the full, you know, any kind of Orthodox prayers that are wonderful, if you can just say, Lord Jesus Christ, and of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's a wonderful way to start your day and to carve out five or 10 minutes to just begin to just parcel through whatever you can of whatever text that you can get a hold of, you will get hooked and it changes you, you know, without reading, without exposure to any kind of text that is edifying or that challenges you. And I'm not just talking about spiritual texts. I'm talking about any kind of really good book, nonfiction, fiction, things that expand your mind or allow you to daydream or to fantasize, you know, different worlds and different times that take you out of yourself. These things are so important because it expands our understanding of other people and other cultures, and it can make us better, you know, especially if we're reading religious texts and reading the Bible. It truly creates a change in us. And if it wasn't for all of the reading that I did for this memoir, gosh, I would not know anything about Mary. I read books on prayer, which were some of my favorite books to read, honestly. Books on how to pray, what prayer really is, what it can do for you, the way that it opens up our consciousness toward God and it changes our physicality even. But anything that you can pick up, five or 10 minutes, it just has to be something really small. It will whet your appetite and it will shock you with how much it changes you. And I can say definitively that by the end of this book that I wrote, you know, after everything that I had read, I had a completely different prayer life, a completely different mindset. I was much more self-aware and I had a much better understanding, not only of Mary, but of my place in the faith. And what my purpose in the faith is and was and possibly can be, depending upon how God wants to use it. And so, yes, please read. (laughs) Read to your children, too. That's so, so important. So even if you can't read for yourself, then, you know, pick up something that you can read to those around you. Because if we don't engage these things, we're going to lose them. And we know culturally, too, that they are also being censored. And if we don't read these things and we don't value them now and internalize them, what happens when we want to reach for them and they're not there anymore? That's, uh, I think, a very important concern that we need to be aware of. Happened over and over again in history, even contemporary Mm -hmm. history. Brandy, I am really grateful for the time that you spent with our audience around the world. Again, I love your writing and you're a whole lot better communicator than you probably think you are. (laughs) Well, thank you. I'm just so touched and so humbled I got to talk to you about this and that you read my book and you've been so generous and kind with all of your praise. And it has been such a treat to get to talk to you. I, I, you know, there's not many people that I really get to have these conversations with, believe it or not. So it's been a real blessing for me to engage you today and to share some of my experience with you. And I'm very, very humbled and very grateful. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, you're welcome, and it was my pleasure as well. Again, the book, A Long Walk with Mary, A Personal Search for the Mother of God. This is must-reading, and we make this book available to those who stand shoulder-to-shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can get your copy on the web at equip, E-Q-U-I-P, 
org. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Hank Unplugged. Look forward to seeing you next time with more of the podcast. So long for now.